The Greenwich Show, in partnership with Greenwich Market, London's favourite arts and craft market. Series 2, made by you. Coming up on the programme, we pay tribute to the legendary and riotous Greenwich comedian who died ten years ago. Uh, invented the term alternative comedy, which is sort of true. We visit a restaurant in the borough that's been voted as the best in the capital. They gave me the chance and the opportunity to be number one. We explore the rich history of Eltham as we visit for our Hidden Villages feature. And so for him to come to this theatre in this area was, was fantastic. And a group of parents in the borough speak of their support for each other and how it helps get the best for their children. Parents with children are slightly older than yours going through problems that you're going to come up against in the next year or so. The Greenwich Show, made by you. Welcome to the third episode of our current series, where we're looking at all things Greenwich. Ten years ago, in January just past, one of the heroes of British comedy left us. He made his name here, hosting what were quite legendary nights in what was then the Tunnel Club. He gave many of today's best-known comedians their first break, and many others were broken here. I'm talking Malcolm Hardy. People outside the industry don't know, but when he died, he actually got like full page, virtually full page uh, obituaries in the Times and the Telegraph and the Guardian. The general image of him being completely mad and unreliable and, you know. He was just so funny. Malcolm's catchphrase is unrepeatable uh, on television. There is this uh, thought that perhaps he might be the most famous comedian of the 20th century. He employed lots of those up-and-coming acts that are now household names, basically. His comedy was his life. It was said to have the most dangerous audiences in London, but I always thought they were firm but fair. They, they had a tendency, if they didn't like you, to uh, show their non-appreciation, possibly by throwing uh, beer glasses at you. Tunnel Club was mad, surreal, uh, anarchic, any of those phrases and more, basically. I used to sit at the back in the sound booth and observe what was going on and it, I, I was overwhelmed by this feeling of sort of he could, I could was either at some sort of post holocaust cabaret or some <laughs> some sort of medieval jousting tournament you know it was really really innovative for its time it was known for its high quality of heckling and one of the reasons for that is they were getting these you know 100,000 pound a year stockbrokers who were sort of heckling in latin and things like this and there was one occasion well, I think more than one occasion where uh, an act wasn't appreciated and they hummed him off. They just went, hmm. And it's very difficult for a, a comedian to actually get back at that. You can't really do a put down if the entire audience is humming at you. Well, there we are, Sean Percival. And, um, <laughs> and um, if you want to say more of Sean Percival, um, boy, where are you going? That's what I miss. Uh, the crowd used to go, when, uh, when an act wasn't going very well, which was normal. And, <laughs> because they, they were an aggressive crowd and they would heckle you off. If, if it wasn't going very well, the crowd would go, Malcolm! 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 <laughs> like, like a sort of uh, uh, a child going, Mom! <laughs> Malcolm! The poor performer would be struggling and struggling to try and win it back, which once or twice they actually managed to do. Um, but they knew then, and then, you know, the audience would get louder and louder. He <laughs> wouldn't be um, on their side, as it were. Oh, my poor performer being, you know, booed off stage. He was uh, not cruel, but I mean, that was kind of part of the, that was part of the game, you know. The other one. 
wonderfully hit cavalcade of comedy. I would never have dreamt of opening up a club when Malcolm was alive, and it was years and years later after he, he, he left us that I thought, yeah, I want to open up a club that I want to go to, really, that I would like to attend. And it's ended up, you know, very much, as I've realised subsequently a few years up the, uh, up the path, that it is very reminiscent of the Tunnel Club. We do love the, 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 the difference and the, the, the surreal and the anarchic. Malcolm is the sort of man that no one really forgets. People thought it was very easy to do Malcolm's autobiography because uh, he just told stories very well. But in fact, uh, he couldn't remember anything. So he not only couldn't remember exact details of things or, 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 or which order they appeared in, but which, uh, which decade they appeared in, he couldn't remember. Uh, so uh, some of the stories in the book look as though they're just fluidly told. But in fact, he'd tell you part of the story, then six months later he'd remember another part. And then eight months later he'd remember another part. And then you think, well, that's a great story, but it can't possibly be true because it's so outrageous. And then you'd find two or three people who'd actually been there and really remember something even more outrageous he'd forgotten to tell you. At one point, he'd actually been uh, arrested in, in a hotel for being naked outside Michael Heseltine, the cabinet minister's room, in nothing but a raincoat. Special Branch didn't like this very much, and he'd forgotten this because it was just an ordinary day for Malcolm. He also uh, uh, claimed that he, he uh, invented the term alternative comedy, which is sort of true because we were down a place called Salcombe and the landlord called it the alternative cabaret because that night the local golf club was putting on a cabaret. So he called it the alternative cabaret and I think Malcolm got the idea from that basically. Any gig that Malcolm ran was like no other gig somehow. You know, obviously a lot of that was just down to M Malcolm's just natural manner on stage you know it wasn't about the jokes he told it was about the whole attitude to the evening of entertainment and that just made every gig he ran different to a conventional gig you know. storm the world with a ba theater performance <laughs> Malcolm drowned about 10 years ago in Rotherhithe uh, in 2005 uh, and uh, he wasn't really known by the public but he was known by the industry and appreciated by the industry not just the comedy industry but by the, the media, the newspapers and the reporters and so on and so I, I thought he deserved to be remembered because of his uh, ability to spot talent all, all the help he gave to the up and coming comedians at the Tunnel Club up the creek and uh, at the Wibbly Wobbly after he left up the creek and so I thought he deserved to rem be remembered for that so I thought I'll start a, a, a reward in his memory at the Edinburgh Fringe. Well, that's, that's actually not altogether true. What I thought was, how did I get free tickets for all the comedy shows in Edinburgh for 10 years? I thought, I'll start an award, and therefore I'll get in for free, and I thought Malcolm would have appreciated this. And now, Another film made by you. It's about a group of parents who all have children with special educational needs or disabilities. They all help support each other so they get the best for their children. I thought I was alone. I think you can feel quite lonely as, as the parent of a child with a disability. I could go looking for help and I didn't know where to go and I was to go in the wrong places. You, you can sort of tend to feel like the only one out there. We are an independent group of parents of children with either a disability or special educational need based in Greenwich. We tend to have coffee mornings on a regular basis. It's not in one particular area. We tend to go to various schools. We exchange ideas and we give advice to each other, which school to go to, how to talk to the teachers how you can find the social workers. And the, the thing that stands out mostly is um, that the pampering carers spend all their time doing the sort of looking after. But when someone offers you a cup of tea or a cake or has made you a cake, it actually is quite pleasant to, to be on the receiving end. You can um, relate with other parents and learn from one another in a private and relaxed environment. What tends to happen is, is uh, parents with children that are slightly older than yours are going through problems that you're going to come up against in the next year or so. 
uh, so it's nice to find out sort of what's coming and uh, how to deal with it. It can be quite a, quite a maze, especially when you enter the school system, you know, finding out which way to go and what was the statementing procedure and um, it just really helps to talk to people who have been there before. It's not new to them that they're telling you exactly how to overcome what you're going through. And it has really opened up my eyes to know that my daughter has got a future, that there are even other people who are going through what I'm going through. This is The Greenwich Show. On the way, the next film in our Hidden Villages series, we take a look at Eltham. I love Greenwich because there's so much going on here, there's always something to do. The Greenwich Show, in partnership with Greenwich Market, London's favourite arts and craft market. Series 2, made by you. Now back to the Hidden Villages feature for this series. We're looking at all the small pockets of Greenwich that you told us about that makes the borough special. This week we're in Eltham with Phoebe Kibbe. Eltham, regarded as one of London's 35 major centres, Originally on the main route from London to Maidstone back in the 6th century, another place of the borough named in the Doomsday Book of 1086, you won't be surprised to hear it's an area steeped in history. And it's also an area full of green space, and our first stop off is Avery Hill Park. On one occasion when we were planting some trees, we found a Mesolithic flint scraper, so that takes the history of people being around this patch until 7000 BC. Colonel North, who built this fantastic place you can see behind me, died in the late 1890s. So the good old London County Council bought it and began to convert it into a public park. The Winter Gardens is the second largest greenhouse, I want a better term, the Winter Garden in the UK after Kew Gardens. Avery Hill Park is the most fantastic place, you want to come and see it. Our series of Hidden Villages picks out some of the borough's bits of beauty. And talking of hidden, there's this little gem of a building, tucked away inside Well Hall Pleasance. This is one of the key community hubs for Elton. The Tudor Barn was built around 1525 by the family, the Roper family, Will Roper, who married Margaret Moore, who was the daughter to Sir Thomas Moore, who was the Lord Chancellor to King Henry VIII. And the Tudor barn is what is left of the estate. Most of the building is in its original state still. We now call it Tudor Barn Upton. We have a huge amount of weddings, corporate events, team building events. Because of the 13 acres of grounds that we have here too, it's a perfect location. We have many community events here as well. We encourage the community to come down and to enjoy all the public events, the free events that we host here for them. One part of Elton is celebrating a centenary anniversary this year. And it's no coincidence that last year was 100 years since the outbreak of the Great War. And so when the First World War broke out in August 1914, the munitions business just needed to expand like crazy. And there weren't enough houses in Woolwich for all the people, all the extra people that the munitions business required. Every house is slightly different from everyone else. It's built on the old um, arts and craft movement, so there's lots of air and space between the houses. Every house has its own little garden. My mother and father-in-law came here in 1915, um, he was drafted from Oxford to come to work in the Woolwich Arsenal. All the houses have, have changed. I mean, when we first came here to live, the bath was in the kitchen, the toilet was in the garden. I'd like to think that it's a place that people come to live because 
they like what's here and that once they got here they just sort of remember that that is why they moved here. I think it's such a nice place and everybody's so friendly you know you, you, you can't beat living here really. Down this street you'll find the home of a community theatre company and okay the name does give it away but the theatre was saved from closure by the actor, performer and comedian in 1981. In 1943, Eltham Little Theatre was established here, of a flourishing amateur theatre group. It had a, a, a strong history for many years, but by 1979, um, membership was waning a little and the lease for the building was due for renewal. It really looked as though Eltham Little Theatre would die. Bob Hope was born in Eltham. He left here when he was a toddler, but he's always maintained his links to his hometown, and he was very keen to help. Bob Hope um, was a major star, as he was until, it, until his death a few years ago. And so for him to come to this theatre in this area was, was fantastic. So we're very important, I think, to this community, not only in providing entertainment for them, but also providing an opportunity for many, many people to get involved in theatre. So I think you'll agree that we found another little hidden village here in Greenwich. And this one certainly has its fair share of history. One of the best things about London is its wide selection of cuisine. The multicultural makeup of the capital means that you can get food from just about anywhere, from anywhere in the world. One such restaurant in Greenwich has been rated highly, very highly. So if I was to ask you, what's your favourite restaurant in London? What would you say? Perhaps a Michelin star fine dining experience. But what about a restaurant in a five-star hotel? Or perhaps a local cafe? Well, the Blue Nile here in Woolwich was recently named the best restaurant in London by website TripAdvisor. It beat off over 17,000 other restaurants to get that top spot. So sure. The Blue Nile Cafe is actually an Eritrean stroke Italian cafe. Why did you decide to open here in Woolwich? I used to own it as a sandwich bar and things didn't work with the recession so we decided to change it to a restaurant. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we said Italian and Eritrean restaurant because we have a lot of uh, influence of Italian in Eritrea. We've been living here for 32 years. There are some communities in, in, in Greenwich, but um, I think the Blue Night restaurant, especially in Woolwich, is the first one in Greenwich. So you've actually only been open for just over a year, mm -hmm. but in that time you've been named the best restaurant in London. So how did that feel when you heard? Well, the first day um, when I was reading my email, I usually were odd socks anyway, but that day, even <laughs> the worst one, I came to the restaurant with my slippers on because I was so shocked and I thought, it can't be, it can't be we are number one. But this, I didn't do it only by myself. I think the um, our customers, they gave me the chance and the opportunity to be number one. I'm going to find out what the customers have got to say about eating at the Blue Nile. We're not spoiled for choice for some fancy, nice places in Woolwich, are we? So, uh, so this is great to have this place in. Woolwich and Greenwich and Charlton are all changing. Um, Blue Nile is a fabulous addition to the area. Great food, great snack and a really good, friendly, family welcoming atmosphere. I don't know too much about Eritrean cuisine. I've never actually tried it before. Mm. So I was hoping you might tell me a bit more about the flavours and some of the ingredients that go into it. Okay. On our stew, it's not spicy, but it's well flavoured. This is homemade chilli, and this is the butter, purified butter. 
this is only we use it for meat this is the only spice we use it smells like pepper but it's nice uh, flavor and this is shiro this is only water onions and uh, olive oil or or sunflower oil okay. and this is we get only from Eritrea but all our ingredient the meat everything we use it locally yeah and uh, some of the vegetables we use also from local allot allotment yeah. which is also good for the for the local community well it all sounds absolutely delicious so i think it's time that i tried some by all means i'll go and then get some for you but as they say the proof is in the pudding before I try the Blue Nile's famous tiramisu though, I'm going to make a stuff on first course. If you've missed any of the films of this series so far, or even the first series, they are available on our YouTube channel. We'll be here next week featuring some more films made by you. And in the meantime, if you want to see what's coming up, here it is. Knitting isn't just about toys and blankets. Guerrilla knitting, which is a form of street art. I know I'll always be able to use my skills that I've learned here, elsewhere. It was a bold thing to put something as modern um, as that into this very historic setting. The Greenwich Show, in partnership with Greenwich Market, London's favourite arts and craft market. Series 2, made by you.